Good afternoon, and welcome back to the Eastern Mediterranean Times weekly podcast. I'm your host, Martin Mont. And I'm your host, Josh Rolitke. All right, jumping right into it, the Gaza War is leaving an imprint on the Caucasus as well as a regional imprint in Israel and Gaza. Israel is one of the primary weapons supporters of Azerbaijan. Turkey is also one of the primary weapons supporters of Azerbaijan. When Azerbaijan attempted to reclaim the territory Archuk successfully earlier in the year, they used majority weapons, specifically offensive drones, that were supplied to them by Israel, as well as artillery that was supplied to them by Turkey. Israel and Turkey seem to be now on opposite sides of the fence when it comes to the Gaza conflict, and this is going to have spillover in future military actions that Azerbaijan is planning. Azerbaijan planning to take some sort of aggression, possibly, to get a corridor in order to transport troops and supplies, as well as just trade from the west part of Azerbaijan to the east part. This would be going through part of Armenia. So there is a possibility for a future aggression sometime soon. But it's contingent on those weapons that Azerbaijan needs from Israel. And right now, if Turkey and Israel are going head to head, those weapons might come to a halt. Yeah, there's also questions of whether Israel can afford to fund something like this as they're trying to uh, fight in Gaza and uh, fight against Hamas, fighting a two front war or supplying uh, a secondary war while they're fighting a war can get pretty difficult, uh, especially financially. Absolutely. And the president of Kazakhstan also coming out stating that the supply corridor between Western Azerbaijan and Eastern Azerbaijan would be crucial for Kazakhstan to be able to trade with Turkey. Him talking to Erdogan directly saying that this corridor is a necessity. Whether it come from military action or diplomatic action is going to depend on those weapons, I presume. So it'll be an interesting area to look at. And again, war is devastating. And any war based off of a supply line from east to west could result in ethnic conflict that's wider than just the scope of the war itself. Indeed. Shifting back to Gaza specifically, this week weekend, Secretary Anthony Blinken made a visit. It was an unannounced visit to the Palestinian as- uh, affiliate in the West Bank. And he met with President Mohammed Abbas, and they discussed de-escalation, as uh, Anthony Blinken calls it, trying to reduce the violence, A, as the primary objective, and B, getting humanitarian aid into Gaza and getting refugees out of Gaza so that they can avoid future civilian casualties. Yeah, this has become pretty critical for the Biden administration, where you've seen both President Biden and Blinken pushing for a humanitarian pause to the conflict to allow for uh, more aid to get to the Palestinians and also to allow for hostages that are still in Gaza uh, to be rescued and evacuated from the area. Yeah, and the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, has made it clear that a ceasefire, as a lot of the world meeting at the United Nations stated that they wanted in the region is unacceptable if those hostages don't get back to Israel. So the best case scenario for reducing the bloodshed right now is likely going to be Blinken's envision of a uh, reduction of violence. Yes. The other story coming out of Gaza is Jordan has been using their air force to drop supplies for Palestinians. And this includes gasoline, medical supplies, food, and it's going to be helping alongside those relief trucks that were going from Egypt to Gaza. And they've continued to go, but it's a slow trickle. And so this is definitely an added benefit to the people who are stuck there. For sure. All right, now moving to Greece. The Golden Dawn is rising from its ashes in a new right-wing movement in Greece. Yeah, so we're seeing the comeback of the Golden Dawn, which was a political party that was banned from politics in Greece, mainly due to their criminal activities. 
uh, such as murdering leftist activists, union workers, and migrants on what they called night patrols. Uh, but we've seen these patrols starting to come back from other neo-Nazi organizations uh, within Greece, uh, especially with the rise of the Spartan Party uh, in its politics, which won nearly 5% of the vote in the last election. Uh, we're also looking at more recently, there is clashes between protesters for the neo-Nazi groups, uh, such as Golden Dawn, um, and also counter-protesters who clashed, uh, claiming that these were obviously fascists uh, and looking to try to expel them in some way from their having this new political voice. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not something that's exactly specific to Greek politics. As we've seen unsatisfaction rise among individuals and citizens of many countries across the, across the globe, we've seen a rise of populism. And Populism has been ushering in a form of modern fascism when it gets into a government, and uh, this this is a worry for the Greek government for sure. Definitely, yeah. I mean, we're looking at countries like Hungary, countries like Slovakia, Italy. Um, numerous countries have been seeing a rise in these right-wing factions across Europe uh, who are playing a more instrumental role in politics, even leading governments, not just being coalition partners. And this has definitely uh, created a lot of concern around the direction of democracy uh, and the direction of authoritarianism in Europe. Absolutely. Swinging from right to left, the Greek government pushes for offshore wind energy expansion in a new speech by the Greek Prime Minister. Yeah, so the Greek government has made it a national priority uh, to move forward with a two gigawatt offshore wind project that would supply power for about one and a half million homes in the country. Uh, this comes as they're looking to identify even more development sites for offshore wind, seeing, as, seeing this as like a key means of pushing forward with renewable energy and trying to curb climate change, which has really been impacting the country lately with a lot of wildfires, flooding, and droughts in the past few months. Yeah, absolutely. And this is also going to become a bit of a diplomatic situation when Greek and Turkish oil companies, specifically natural gas companies, tried to drill in the EEZs, the economic exclusion zones surrounding the two countries, especially in the Aegean Sea before, we've seen naval clashes between the two countries. And if you're going to be putting offshore wind in places like this, mind you, most of the Greek EEZ is not in the Aegean Sea, it's in the Mediterranean, but if you do put this in the Aegean, which they will undoubtedly look to do at some point, it could create a bit of a diplomatic conversation, at the very least, between Turkey and Greece about does a wind turbine extend my EEZ, does a wind turbine, is a wind turbine considered part of my EEZ, is, is it actually a resource that we're generating from the water, or is it a resource we're generating from the wind? And these are things that haven't really been codified in the uh, United Nations Committee on the Open Seas. So it'll be interesting to, uh, to see how this goes forward. For sure. All right. Thank you for tuning in to the Eastern Mediterranean Times podcast. Just a small update from the Institute of Eastern Mediterranean Studies in Boston. Tonight, we'll be hosting the ambassador to the United Nations from Albania. He's the permanent representative from Albania to the United Nations. And we're going to have a conversation about global security in the Balkan states. Right now, he also represents our Albania's seat in the Security Council. And that is happening tonight at 6 p.m. in the Library Lecture Hall at Emanuel College, Boston, 400 The Fenway. All right, we hope to see you there. I've been your host, Martin Mont. And I'm your host, Joshua Lutke. As always, have a great week.